Steve. Should I say anything? Oh, yeah. Only right. once. Let everybody else do their own. Real quick. Everything good? Good. Am I, am I on, Stacy? Yeah. Good evening. We good? On that gamble. I know. We good? I'll get it. Uh, good evening. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome Sarah Ladar, who will lead us in our invocation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Would you please pray with me? Dear Lord. May we begin by asking for you to grant peace to the loved ones of nearly 6,000 Georgians that have lost their lives to COVID-19. May we remember that while this is a mild inconvenience to most of us, we have many vulnerable neighbors. May we not take for granted the luxury of a home to work from and the flexibility to homeschool our children. Let us not forget those who do not have these options. Help us to simplify our activities and traditions so we can focus on caring for and protecting each other. Tonight we pray for our mayor, for the various levels of city officials, and in particular for this assembled council. We ask that you would graciously grant them confidence in their knowledge of what is good and fitting. We pray for the agenda set before them this evening. Please give an assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who choose to make Milton their home. It is in your name we pray. Amen. 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 I would like to call the regular meeting of the Milton City Council for Wednesday, September 9th, 2020 to order. The city strongly recommends that you review tonight's agenda carefully, and if you wish to speak on any item on the agenda, please bring your comment cards to the clerk as soon as possible. While the Milton rules allow a speaker to turn in their comment card up until the clerk calls the agenda item, once the agenda item is called, no more comment cards can be accepted. Will the city clerk please call the roll and make general announcements? Good evening, Mayor and Pro Tem. I'm oh, sorry. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. I will be happy to call roll for the September 9th, 2020 regular meeting. I would like to remind those in attendance to please silence all cell phones at this time. Those attending the meeting would, who would like to make a public comment, you are required to complete a public comment card prior to speaking on the item. All speakers, please identify yourself by name, address, and organization before beginning your comment. If you are representing an organization, an affidavit is required stating you have the authority to speak on behalf of that organization. Demonstration of any sort within the chamber is prohibited. Please refrain from any applause, cheering, booing, outburst, or dialogue with any person speaking. Anyone in violation will be asked to leave. Please confirm your attendance. Council Member Rick Mork. Here. Council Member Laura Bentley. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Peyton Jamison. Here. Councilmember Carol Cookley. Here. And Councilmember Joe Longoria. Here. For the record, Mayor Joe Lockwood and Councilmember Paul Moore are absent. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will the city clerk please sound the next item? The next item is approval of meeting agenda, agenda item number 2239. Thank you. Um, I'd like to add an executive session to discuss land acquisition and personnel. That can be in the motion. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I think we may need, may need to discuss potential litigation as well. Okay, so scratch that. I would like to have a motion to add executive, to add an executive session to discuss land acquisition, personnel, and potential litigation. Everything. Mayor, I'd like to make, Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to accept the agenda with the addition of an executive session for land acquisition, personnel, and potential lit litigation. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Bentley and a second from Councilmember Cookerly. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oppose? Okay. Um, Tammy, is there any general public comment this evening? I've not been given any. Uh, okay. Stacy, do you have any through? No, sir, we do not have any. Okay. So that will, no public comment. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Will the city clerk sound the items? Our first item is approval of the August 3rd, 2020 regular city council meeting minutes. Agenda item number 2240. 
Next is the approval of the financial statements and investment report for the period ending July 2020, agenda item number 2241. Our third item is approval of a construction services agreement with DAF Concrete Inc. for the construction of the Cogburn Road Sidewalk Improvement Program, agenda item number 2242. Our fourth item is approval of an agreement between City of Milton, Georgia and Open Edge, a subsidiary of Global Payments Direct Inc. for electronic payment processing services that integrate with ENCODE, agenda item number 2243. Our fifth item is approval of a professional services agreement with Davis Engineering and Survey for Survey and Platt Services. Agenda item number 2244. Next is the approval of a task order between the City of Milton and Pond and Company, Inc. to provide preliminary engineering for Morris Road widening. Agenda item number 2245. Our seventh item is approval of a change order number one to the agreement between the City of Milton and Lowe Engineers to provide temporary plan review services for July through September of 2020. Agenda item number 2246. Our eighth and final consent item is the approval of a change order number one agreement between the City of Milton and the Atlanta Regional Commission, known as the ARC, to extend the end date of the contract to December the 10th, 2020, related to the City's Smart Communities Grant Project, the Walking School Bus. Agenda item number 2247. Thank you. Is there a uh, motion on the consent agenda as read? Mayor, I move that we approve the uh, cons consent agenda as read by clerk. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Longoria and a second from Councilmember Morg. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, moving on to reports and presentation, will the city clerk please sound the first item? Our first item is the proclamation recognizing suicide prevention. Mayor Pro Tem Peyton Jamison. Thank you. Um, I know this is a, a uh, important week. I know we have a lot of people in the crowd with the LRJ Foundation that has been working uh, on this. And I know Councilmember Bentley would like to say some remarks after I read this proclamation and then we'll come up and um, take a picture. Um, so this is the Recognizing National Suicide Prevention Week. Whereas National Suicide Prevention Week is an annual week-long campaign in the United States to inform and engage health professionals and the general public about suicide prevention and the warning signs of suicide running this year from September 6th to September 12th, and World Suicide Prevention Day is recognized annually on September 10th. And whereas suicide is now the second leading cause of death among Americans ages 15 to 24, and whereas one of the myths about suicide is that talking about it causes suicide when research shows the opposites, the opposite since engaging someone in a deliberate, caring conversation about suicide can be a critical first step toward preventing suicide. And whereas the city of Milton constantly strives to provide the best quality of life for its residents, young and old, by finding ways to create strong sense of community, well-informed populace, and provide invaluable connectedness and whereas, if Milton is to be the best place to call home, we must be willing to discuss difficult topics like suicide, recognizing that talking about suicide can remove the stigma and help save lives. And whereas, all members of the city of Milton take responsibility together to do all that we can to support and guide our citizens. Through our service, we care for one another and strengthen Milton's cherished sense of community. Now, therefore, we, the mayor and the city council of the city of Milton, proclaim September 10th to be Suicide Prevention Day in Milton, and we actively demonstrate the city's commitment to citizens' health and well-being by partnering with the LRJ Foundation to host a virtual forum, the Milton Mental Wellness Webinar, on Thursday, September 10th. This event aims to stimulate a community conversation about suicide while sharing resources and tools for improving mental wellness given under our hand and seal of the city of Milton, Georgia, on this ninth day of September 2020. Thank you. And Councilmember Bentley? Now, I'd, I'd like to thank um, our city. Um, you know, we embrace our quality of life and, and, and recognizing that suicide 
is a part of our community. This is the second year that we have not just um, participated but hosted a suicide event. So I'm tremendously proud of that, and I know the, this council is as well. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to have a special moment of thanks to Teresa Rusby, who is in the, um, in the audience tonight. She has worked tirelessly to um, reinvent a suicide um, awareness event into a mental wellness, and it's got a great um, message, and I'm so proud of the work that she's done with our staff and, her, and, and the expertise that her, her LRJ uh, members bring to the conversation, which is tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, and it's uh, via Zoom and Facebook Live, so please tune in. It's going to be awesome. Thank you so much. Carol? You know, there are many things that I would um, appreciate, publicly appreciate and thank Councilman, Councilwoman Bentley for, but this is at the top of my list because without her leadership on this and her constant um, efforts on social media to keep this issue top of mind, I don't know that Milton would have such a, a robust awareness. And so, Councilwoman, I just want you to know that your, um, your efforts are not missed by me or anybody, but we are, are lucky that you are in your perseverance and your dedication to this issue and other issues. Thank you. Um, anyone else? All right. If you all want to come up, we'll take pictures and give you the proclamation. Do you stand? Do you stand? They're going to they're stand down here. We're going to stay up here. Six feet. <laughs> Six feet. It's still a wide angle lens, right? It is. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> This is the first one, right? Yeah, I think I really appreciate it. Thank you. And there's a for you. Will the city clerk please sound the next item? If you need more, just let me know. Okay. Thank you so much. Our next item is the 2020 census update that's presented by Ms. Michelle McIntosh Ross. Here. Greetings, greetings. I'm Michelle McIntosh Ross, City of Milton. Um, uh, so I'm here to uh, talk about the census again. Um, just want to reiterate um, because we need everyone counted. Um, this is the last month, so we're really doing a big push for the last month to get everyone counted in the city of Milton. And you've seen a lot of this um, before, but I have some slides on here, like with QR codes and whatnot, so folks at home can use their phone and go straight to the census. So I'm hoping that folks at home you know, are listening and who weren't here before, I would get some of this information. So we need everyone to take part in the 2020 census, and here's our QR code. Okay, um, we want to get an accurate population count for the city of Milton. Um, this is very important. Um, it allocates federal dollars for the next 10 years. So folks can still respond, um, you know, all the way to the end of September by going to the website or calling or mailing in their form. So they're still able to do that. 
Okay, so today I'm going to talk about you know what the census is and why we need to do it, and then also um, just mention some of the local preparation that we did um, in you know years ago to come to this point, and then um, why it's important locally, and we're going to show some of the things that we're going to be doing this month um, to get everyone counted, and then of course we have questions and dialogue. Okay, so why? So it's an official count of the population. It happens every 10 years. It's in the uh, Constitution since 1790. Um, it, um, the U.S. Com commemorates uh, Census Day April 1st uh, every 10 years. And um, for the last census uh, 10 years ago, um, the estimate was that it allocated roughly $675 billion federal dollars, and that goes to things like roads, um, schools, hospitals, uh, social programs, etc. cetera. Um, so it's really important because non-response to the census questionnaire can result in an undercount um, for the population, which results in that um, uh, estimate when you divide it up at, at 1,600 per each person in Georgia. Um, it's used to um, determine the legislative representatives, um, every level of government, you know, the population defines drawing the Georgia representative lines as well as Milton Council districts. Um, and so it can skew um, a lot of the lines if we don't have an accurate count. Um, this was from the previous census. Some states gained, some states lost. Georgia happened to gain. Hopefully you won't lose um, this time. Um, this is the census. Um, it, it happens once um, every 10 years, and it counts every person once um, in the right place. That's um, what it's meant to do. Um, it's also the civic duty of every person to participate. Um, it's only 10 questions, or roughly, it's like seven plus drop downs. Um, you'll see I have some questions in a later slide. Um, and it's available in, in 12 languages over the phone, and you can request for any language that you need. Um, all of the data collection is private. And um, just to mention, in 2010, our population logged in at 32,661. And so we'll see what we turn out to be this year. We know folks like me are always anxiously waiting on what the population um, estimate or actual, the actual population would be. So we're thinking 40,039, we'll see. Um, we didn't do a, a bet on it, but we'll see. Um, these are the questions uh, that shows up on the census. So um, all we want to know is how many people are living uh, or staying at the house um, in April, um, whether the house is owned or rented, uh, what the genders are for each person, the age, race of each person, and um, whether the person is Hispanic or of uh, Latino origin, and what the relationship is to the head person in the household. So is it your uncle, your sister, your daughter, whatever. So. All, all things we should know already. You don't have to research any of this. So this is just um, the breakdown of the funding. Um, if we took, this is just an example, if we took that 1,600 per person in Georgia um, over the 10 years, that will equal uh, 1.6 million. Um, uh, and let's just say um, we missed, you know, 100 people on the census in 2010. That um, works out to be that, you know, we missed the, the 1.6 million. Um, just looking at response rates, for instance, um, Georgia, I believe, may have responded at 72% um, last time for 2010. Um, so at that rate with, you know, 10.5 million residents, right, at 72% responding, we only, you know, uh, calculated 7.56 um, people in Georgia, um, which, you know, we were short um, 2.9 or so people, which uh, translates into, you know, the dollar amount of something like 47 um, billion uh, missing from the coffers in, in Georgia. And so if, if you relate to Milton, um, we responded back in 2010 at roughly 85 maybe or 87 percent, but this, of course, is just for demonstration. Um, so if we responded at 87 percent and we are estimating 40,000 Milton residents, then we would 
be short, right? We would be counting only 34, um, 34,800 people, which would cause us to be short by 5,200 folks, and then translating to, you know, 83 million that we would be missing. So it's really important that um, everybody should count. But of course, this is all over 10 years, right? So it all calculates out. So again, um, we just want um, folks to respond because it distributes all these federal dollars throughout the state. And of course, Milton gets its share. And I think I mentioned some of these before with the um, skewing of the lines. Um, this is a, a map of our council districts. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how um, the uh, the census pertains to all of the departments, you know, in city government um, with getting sales tax share uh, throughout the county. It's based on the census um, data of population size as well as the T-plus dollars. Um, of course, public works relates back to the T-plus dollars with projects and funding for those. Um, you know, the public safety, the um, insurance service rating for the um, public safety. It, relates back to the um, uh, population number as well as crime stats. It's always based on population, parks and rec, level of service, committed, uh, community development, and economic development. We need those numbers for long-range planning. We're doing our comprehensive plan now, and you know those numbers are really important as far as um, how we're going to plan for the next 10, 20 years, etc. And then the grants, grants that we apply for, and you know we've been getting uh, um, some grants lately, a lot of these you know, are based on the population and what the uh, information that the uh, census gathers. Um, some uh, grant opportunities just, you know, it, it, it's um, uh, evidence-based funding, which all of that data comes from um, the census. Um, also, for the state of Georgia, they get their federal money to fund the grant part that we apply for comes from the uh, census um, that the... Um, that we collect in order to allocate money to Georgia. So there's, you know, it's really important for Georgia and Milton to get the accurate count so that we can divvy up um, all these things accurately. Real quick, I have one slide on all of the work we've been doing. Um, so back in 2017, as you can see, we had a resolution in November to say that we were going to participate in the census and participate in the um, um, local update of the census addresses, which we worked on um, between 17, 18, and 19, um, to make sure the Census Bureau had all of the accurate um, addresses for Milton to be able to, to do the count and send the letters out and so on. Um, we, um, in that project, we were able to submit an additional 2,376 addresses that they did not have. Um, there was also another program that we worked on um, closer to the census, which ended um, October of 2019, which was to submit any new construction um, permits and so on for um, homes that we thought would be finished by uh, April of 2020. And so we submitted that. And it was like 300 plus new addresses there. And then um, I'll get to a slide where we're talking about all of the things that we're doing this year that we did and what we'll do for September. Um, our communication and engagement um, folks have been very helpful with coming up with strategies to get out to folks the information and um, to increase our response rate for the census. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So here is a map of um, the census response rate for the city of Milton. This is available on the website. Um, so right now today, uh, when I checked it, our self-response rate for the city of Milton is 72.2%. Um, you'll see the different census tracts on here. And um, I went ahead and just put the response for two of the census tracts. I couldn't fill this map up too much, but um, that darkest blue, which is, looks almost black, um, is responding at 87% um, uh, total uh, for that census tract, so that's really good. All of the darker blues are you know, above 75%, so those are, are good responding. Um, we do have... Um, a low responding um, census track here, which is along 400, Winwood Parkway, Deerfield, Morris Road, etc. And um, that census track is responding at 48.3%. Uh, so um, we really need um, 
you know, some more uh, response in that area. And I'll pick on that area a little bit when I um, go into the projects. Um, but I just wanted uh, us to see where we were with that. Now, back in 2010, Milton um, responded, self-response rate was the same as right now. It was 72.2. So we actually have just met our previous response rate from 2010. Um, I just threw in on the slide there um, the other uh, cities in our area and what they are doing. But we don't need to mention them. Um, let's see. So here's um, the TSPLOS um, that was approved back in 2016. So um, basically, um, this whole funding mechanism, um, you see Alpharetta is on there, Johns Creek, Milton, Mountain Park, et cetera. Um, it's based, the, the, the um, divvying up all of the money is based on the population. So it says, you know, what the population um, for each of these cities are, and so then that's how they allot the money. And they've just taken that number from the census. So if you have an accurate count, then this really helps. And if we have a better response rate and the rest of folks, it really helps even more. But um, just wanted to, to let you know this. And this just shows that uh, it's a piece of the pie. We will get what we get based on, on the count. Uh, so yeah, so I did say I was going to pick on um, that uh, census tract that wasn't responding. So we have um, T-SPLOST um, projects in there, as you can see, along, um, uh, which one is that? Morris Road widening, and then we have um, a project on Winwood Parkway, and um, you know we're waiting on you know collecting all of those funds through um, T-SPLOST and, of course, other um, funding mechanisms. But, um, you know, so, you know, being a low responding area, if we had more counts, you know, we'd probably have more of the proportion of, of that, um, that dollar amount for these projects. Also, um, we just concluded our trails um, prioritization plan, and we have all of these really um, wonderful projects in the Deerfield area that we want to do. Um, we have different tiers, um, and it's all based on funding. Of course, we're using additional funding, impact fees, and so on, but some of the funding is TS plus and seal stacks and whatever we can use, and um, you know, the quicker we can get the funding, it'll be better. So um, if anyone is out there in this area um, and you like these projects, you should fill out your census um, so that um, we, we can get those counts. Um, this is just a summary, um, you know, just to take part and in the census, all the dollars that um, will be missing out. So this is what I wanted to get at. It is um, getting the residents counted. Um, like I said, our communication and community engagement um, staff has been working really hard on um, this September um, with weekly uh, updates. Um, we posted this um, on our website um, so that folks can see it, have a, um, a presence as soon as you go to the website. Um, social media, we've been doing that weekly. Also getting into the Herald and the Neighbor and the Patch newspapers, um, talking with the school boards, um, the teachers. We sent letters out to our kids' uh, school and teachers, uh, and the principals, also the faith-based folks. We want them to uh, spread the word. Um, we have signs that are going out, and um, since the signs are already out, you, you've seen those around. Um, I also put um, the census on our upcoming community um, engagement for the comprehensive plan. Um, that was Greg's idea. Thanks, Greg, to go ahead and put um, a link to the census on there. So those signs will be out there, uh, and we'll be able to capture those folks um, who are interested in comprehensive planning can go ahead and uh, hopefully if they hadn't filled their census out, they can do so. Um, we're also making calls and emailing businesses, HOAs, the apartment complexes, and civic organizations. Um, we're working with the census personnel to see how we can combine efforts. Um, we had um, we allowed the census folks to use our community place to do training, and um, they concluded the training maybe a week or it's about two or three weeks ago. And so they've been um, uh, going door to door through the month of September to get uh, folks counted. Um, but again, we want people to go online and go ahead and self-respond. Um, let's see, we have flyers uh, that we're putting out at gas stations and stores. Um, we got um, uh, Chick-fil-A to commit 
to um, having uh, give out uh, information at the Chick Fil A line. So that's a lot of people, right? You know, in that Chick Fil A line at lunch. So that was a really good. I had a good idea. That was um, Anita's idea. Um, let's see. We want to. Um, we're going to have. Uh, uh, specific to Deerfield, the Deerfield corridor, um, to include um, a digital sign out there. Um, also, um, is, I think it's on the 15th, I forget which day, um, we're going to have a COVID testing. So um, we're going to have signs, yes, yeah, September 15th at um, Stone Creek Church. So over in, in that area during that COVID testing, we're going to have signs and flyers and, and hopefully a presence out there to help um, push um, the, the, the response um, in that area as folks come out there to um, get tested. Um, uh, we're going to have our, our firefighters um, help spread the word. I don't know if you know or remember when the Fulton County had their challenge uh, for doing a video, our firefighters came in second. So um, we see that that's a, a good um, idea to use the, our firefighters to help get that word out. Um, also, um, we're challenging our inspectors and um, uh, other folks who go out into the field to mention the census whenever um, we do that. Um, also, the library uh, is doing a, um, uh, at the book drop-off, they'll have signage and so on there. Um, and, uh, oh, at the upcoming public safety um, uh, uh, event, we're going to mention the census. So folks who come out, of course, that's also in their fields. That's a good place to um, mention it. Uh, and then we're going to hopefully hold a neighborhood popsicle event to, um, to cap this all off. So if you guys think of anything else um, that we hadn't thought of or, um, you know, just encourage folks to, to sign up. Also, um, folks who uh, maybe they signed up, but their neighbors didn't sign up and census workers are out. You can let the census worker know what's going on, like how many people are in that house or what have you. I had somebody, census would come up my driveway, so they, some, somebody in my neighborhood didn't, didn't respond. But, um, but yeah, just, you know, get the word out. It's the last push um, to, to get census out. So the main thing, the message we want to send is that you can still respond online or via phone or send in the mail. You don't have to wait for folks to come out and knock on your door. And everyone can play their role in the 2020 census um, by encouraging their friends and family to participate. So um, any questions um, we have? Any questions for Michelle? All right. Thank you. Okay. So great. So hopefully this will help folks at home to uh, sign up for the census. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Will the city clerk please sound the final presentation item? The final item is presentation of lighting proposals for Hopewell Road at Hamby Road and Hopewell Road at Thompson Road Roundabout. Mr. Robert Drury. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Council. Uh, back in February, we made a presentation to you about the lighting of these two, uh, two roundabout projects. Uh, at that time, we didn't really have good cost. Uh, we're at the point now where we do have some good cost. So I'm going to go through a, a rather short presentation to kind of explain uh, what we're looking at as far as the uh, lighting and the cost therein. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll be able to get some sort of a guidance from the, uh, from the council. Uh, in February, we did make a presentation. And the general consensus that came out of that, if you haven't uh, gone back and listened to the meeting, is uh, in favor of some decorative lighting. There was some, some uh, favorable responses to putting in decorative lighting. And of the decorative lighting, I think the consensus was those shepherd hooks. So if you recall at that presentation, we presented this slide. This is existing lighting options that do uh, occur in the city of Milton and the shepherd hooks being the one on the far right and I should have numbered these these and I did not but the two middle ones are typically pedestrian lighting and uh, for what we're going to light up they're really not uh, applicable to roundabouts but the three on the left we'll talk about a little bit and the shepherd hook on the on the far right so these are, are lighting options that do exist in the city of Milton 
This slide shows you uh, those two roundabouts, Hopewell at Thompson and the upper right being Hopewell at Hamby. Um, the lights, basically on the routes as you're approaching those intersections, you see each individual dot is an existing light. Typically those lights, I just went dark. Okay, thank you. So each one of those dots are, are, are lights that exist out there now, and typically those lights are either those cobra headlights with a mast arm or some sort of a spotlight. So as you see, when you approach these intersections, there are some dark areas in here. Uh, Hamby is dark before you approach Hopewell, and it's like Thompson at uh, Bell Memorial Park is, is fairly dark, of course. When there's games on, that, that, that area is lit up pretty well. But that gives you an idea of some of the existing lights that are out there. Okay. So what we've done is we've approached Georgia Power. Um, these two roundabouts are served by power from Sawney. Sawney does not provide the shepherd hook decorative lights. So we went to the Georgia Power Lighting. It's a separate group from Georgia Power and received proposals from them. We're going to get into those costs. But the proposal is based on this lighting arrangement. You see Thompson and Hopewell. There's 14 of the Shepherd Hook lights and Hopewell at Hamby. There's nine of the Roadway Shepherd lights. Um, this will meet the lighting standard. If you recall at the February meeting, we did introduce to you the Georgia DOT standard on illuminations. Um, this will meet those illumination standards. Uh, Georgia Power pretty much does that um, for every lighting event they have. So that gives you an idea of the lighting proposed. And the cost for those decorative lights, and we'll try to describe this as best I can. And I don't, the mouse is not working on your screen. So I'll kind of walk through this a little bit. We received bids for the construction of roundabouts inside those bids. Thank you. In those bids, we did get cost for, for the contractor to install the shepherd hook lights. And these are the costs that came out of those bids. Thompson, the upfront cost is $130,000. Hamby, the upfront cost is $90,000. The meter is a monthly cost, the power. Uh, and that's based on current costs that we have now for those types of lights. So it's $140 a month. And there is a service fee if the contractor installs these lights. If the lights go out or if they have problems or a car hits it, the city of Milton would have to pay for those uh, repairs. That's if the contractor installs the light. Also in that bid, we do have uh, uh, good prices for underground work. That's the conduit the contractor will have to put into the ground. So the conduit installation for Thompson is 52000 and the conduit installation for Hambry is 41000 The Georgia Power proposal that was given to us uh, is, is slightly different. Uh, and it's based on the same lighting plan that you see that I showed you. And the uh, initial cost is 83464 at Thompson and 53000 some change at Hamby. Um, for Georgia Power, there would be an agreement if we chose to go that option. I'll present to, to the council in a future meeting an agreement with uh, Georgia Power to install these lights. And that would be a monthly service charge of $350 a month for Thompson and $225 a month per light for, for uh, Hamby, but that is total repair costs. So if the lights go out, if it's hit by a car, Milton would pay nothing. That's included in that, in, that, in that monthly cost. So to sum that all up, is it's expensive to install these decorative lights, um, but they do give you a nice product, uh, and that seemed to be the consensus the city council wanted to, to go. The other option we did bring up in our February meeting is, a, is more of a minimal approach, similar to that what we have at Providence and uh, 
Freemanville roundabout. It's, uh, for the most part, putting a flood light, flood type light on an existing timber pole. Uh, and these would be served by a uh, Sawney. Costs are very minimal, about $500 per pole, depends on where we laid out the poles and how many poles we're gonna need. Uh, it probably wouldn't meet the standard that we or, or try to design by for the Georgia DOT, but it would provide some light at that roundabout. Uh, much less cost. Install cost is almost insignificant, and the annual cost, if you see in the middle of this uh, slide, is anywhere between 16 to $26 a month per pole. So it's substantially less, but that is an option. And as I said, we do have that at uh, Providence and Freemanville roundabout. Earlier today, we did, I did do a spreadsheet that I think you were provided a copy of that kind of outlined the uh, cost, and I think I costed it out for a 12-year period. The initial cost, first-year cost for uh, Hopewell Thompson, if the contractor installs, it's 185000 If Georgia Power installs, it's 140000 at Thompson. And Hamby, the initial cost is 133000 and some change. And Georgia Power installed would be 80, excuse me, 97000 over $97,000. Um, I am seeking some guidance tonight because we are ready to uh, begin the process to award the contract for construction. And before we award the contract, we need to know if we're going to include lighting in that in that award or not. Um, I'm actually I hope to present at the next meeting the the bids for construction. So we're asking for some guidance. It's it's it's, it's council's choice of which direction that uh, you want to see Milton light up. There is some ideas to keep consistency throughout the city of Milton, um, not like the crab apple area you've got the very high profile pedestrian lighting and some shepherd lighting in the crab apple area these being a little further outside of the city limits um any questions, questions yeah, Robert? i have one oh, go ahead all right laura oh, oh um so are the only place that the shepherd's crooks are currently that are not in crab apple that's Prov uh, providence at birmingham Yes, that, is, that okay. is correct. And if those uh, fixtures are knocked over, do they are they replaced by DOT or us? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't know if we have a lighting agreement with Georgia okay. Power on those or not. So, do they in Crab Apple? Do the Shepherd's Crooks? Do they have they gotten hit? Uh, not, to, not on one. Yeah, we did actually have one hit at the roundabout. Okay. That's what I. Uh, okay. When I first got here, there was one that was hit. And um, I believe Milton paid for that, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you're correct. Yeah, we, we, we went to the insurance that. company for it, but That's uh, right. I believe we, we were the ones who initially laid out the money okay. for it. That's correct. Um, and Thank you, was the price, uh, did I miss that? How much do those fixtures cost? Is that in the analysis, the upfront cost of buying the fixture? The yes, ma'am. It's, it's the slide okay. is in front of you. Okay. The upfront cost if a contract installs or the upfront cost if we go through an arrangement with Georgia Power. Okay, so that includes labor and the product, okay. Yeah, and the materials, yes ma'am. And my last question is for the the spotlight that um, what we're utilizing at um, Providence and Freemanville, that yes. roundabout. Yes ma'am. You said that, that that's not to DOT standard. It, is there a way to bring it to, to standard using those spotlights? Uh, it's difficult. It can be done, but then you're putting in a lot of timber poles in along and around the roundabout. Um, and, of course, it's not decorative. Um, but it, it can be. It's a little bit more difficult because it's a different kind of light. Can you co-locate them on a pole yes. in yes, different directions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Carol? Would you repeat that last part? Uh, the Sony available lighting option and the cost. Okay, um, the slide is up in front of you. Right. Um, Sony can install these poles and and the lighting uh, at a very minimal cost. The monthly cost is sixteen dollars a month for the smaller wattage, and four hundred watts is twenty six dollars a month per pole. I think we have two poles at Freemanville and Providence that are that are, have lights attached to them. I think one pole may have two lights, as you mm -hmm. talked about co locating. Um, we, if we can't find an existing pole to put it on, we'll have to drop a timber pole 
to at least get some lights up. So how many how many poles would we need? What are we talking? How many shepherd's crooks versus regular poles? And which would give sort of a some light but not light it up like Walmart? Yeah, um, the shepherd light proposal that we have was done by Georgia Power Lighting mm -hmm. per their standards. We haven't done that application to design the layout uh, for, the, for the timber lights, for the minimal approach. Uh, we would have to hire a lighting engineer to kind of help us, guide us through where the good location for those poles would be. So I don't have a cost for that. It, like I said, it's significantly less. It doesn't give you, you know, obviously the decorative look. Right. Um, but I don't have a cost for that. It's, it's substantially less, though. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Are we doing anything decorative in these roundabouts? Like the only roundabout that we have so far is Birmingham and Providence that has a shepherd's. Like everything else, I think, has the those lights here in front of us. That's correct. So and, I'm, I'm all about things that look good, but I'm also all about the people's money because we're all peoples. So um, I would be interested in what that cost was be, is because... I mean, are, are you all stuck on the shepherd's thing? I, no, I think I'm not. It can be I'm kind based of over, on the cost now. Yeah, I think it's kind of overdone and kind of, I mean. So that's, uh, rural to me is, is you use the word minimal. Right, And minimal. I see these roundabouts back into the more rural areas, and I'm fine with the way, and this is my opinion, uh, uh, you know, the way Providence at Freemanville looks of course, our number one goal, I think, you know, safely say, is safety. Right. And I don't just you know, enough. Think just anyone enough light. wants their the lights shining in anyone's, you know. But in the more rural areas, you know, I think just it blending in. Yeah. Without. I think we need to see those numbers. It it can look kind of cutesy with the other the shepherd's crook and sure. Sure. your kind of equestrian thing, and that's kind of sheepish. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, is, in terms of what we have today, was any of it covered under a form-based code or a part of uh, some kind of code that we already put in place? Or what, what drove the choices where the shepherd's hook is currently in use? I'm a little bit outside of my because knowledge, but how, how do we make that decision one day, and then we turn around and we make a different decision another day? I, I'm not sure I understand what's what's driving that. That shepherd's hook. The only one is on that that Birmingham and that's a D that might have been a DOT thing. It, I was going to say that's a DOT okay. project. All right. so I had to meet the DOT that makes DOT sense then. So so it was Be a choice outside of our control. That's what I'm thinking. They paid, yeah, they yeah, paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I would like to add, too, that, and I, I failed to mention this earlier in the presentation, but the, all the upfront cost, install costs, would be t -splossed. It wouldn't be uh, funded by me, even though the maintenance and operation budget would fund the monthly service cost and power cost. Rick? On the monthly cost, Robert, is that per intersection or is that per light, the 350 and the 225? That would be per light. So it would yeah. cost, so the cost of power... No, I'm, forgive me, no. you're wrong. Okay. I, my apologies. It's per the arrangement they provided. So it's 14 lights for Thompson, it's 350 a month, okay. and 225 for Hamby is for nine lights. Thank you. I apologize for that. Versus the 16 bucks Correct. per light, and then multiply that out times 12 months times infinity. And, okay. Correct. And so you said the upfront cost per the... the uh, Freemanville Providence type poles like five hundred a pole. Is that about that's, right? That's typically what we pay for so dropping. We a pole. use about the same poles. That's fourteen plus twelve you know, times five. Pr pretty much, that'd be close to what our upfront cost that's, would be. That's close, and there's going to be some existing poles out there we right. can use as well. We use so that's like yeah, that's pretty much saves a hundred grand. Yeah. I mean, more than a hundred grand. Yeah. Right? Exactly. yeah. Plus the money. So I, you know, I'm all about saving money. I think and. Yeah. I think that's pro this is probably makes sense. I, I think sense. the citizens would rather see us put yeah, the money grand into on a park, or, park. I mean, person. because if you go home, look at a Providence in Freemanville, and to me, that's what a rural roundabout. Yeah. Yeah. I think the overlit thing is weird. Well, thank you. I got our guidance. All right, I appreciate I, I that. Agree. 
Thank you very Anything much, else? Robert. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Robert. You. All right. Uh, moving on, will the city clerk please sound the first presentation items? The first item is consideration of an ordinance of the mayor and council of the city of Milton, Georgia, to adopt amendments to the fiscal year 2020 budget for each fund of the city of Milton, Georgia, amending the amount shown in each budget as expenditures, amending the several items of revenue anticipation, prohibiting expenditures to exceed appropriations, and prohibiting expenditures to exceed actual funding available. Agenda item number 20, 248. Second item is the consideration of an ordinance of the mayor and city and council of the city of Milton, Georgia, to adopt the fiscal 2021 budget for each fund of the city of Milton, Georgia, appropriating the several items of revenue appropriations, prohibiting expenditures to exceed appropriations, and prohibiting expenditures to exceed actual funding available. Agenda item number 20249. Our third item is consideration of an ordinance to amend Chapter 4, Section 138, Promotion and Sales of the Alcoholic Beverages of the Code of the City of Milton. Agenda item number 20250. Our fourth and final item is the consideration of an ordinance to amend Chapter 2, Division 4, Section 2, 390, Transfer of Disposition of Assets, Notice of the Code of the City of Milton. Agenda item number 20251. All right, thank you. Um, is there a motion on the first presentation items? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I make a motion that we accept the first presentation as read. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Morig and a second from Councilmember Bentley um, <coughs> to approve the uh, first presentation items as read. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And moving on to our public hearing, will the city clerk please sound the first item? The first item is consideration of the issuance of an alcoholic beverage license to W&H Star Group, Inc. at 13085 Highway 9, Suite 440 in Milton, Georgia. Agenda item number 2252, Ms. Bernadette Harville. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This evening you have before you an alcohol beverage license request for W&H Star Group um, doing business as Umi, Sushi, and Hibachi off Highway 9 for consumption on premises of wine and malt beverages. The applicant is in compliance and staff recommends approval. Thank you. All right. Um, will the city clerk please sound the next book? The next item is consideration of an ordinance of the mayor and council of the city of Milton, Georgia to adopt amendments to the fiscal year 2020 budget for each fund of the city of Milton, Georgia, amending the amount Chair, to... Mr. Mayor, we we have, right. I, I do think that we need to, to hold a public hearing that we at least announced. Oh, uh, okay. So on my script, so are we, we're not voting on this tonight, though, correct? Just the alcohol. Oh, we are voting on it. Just the alcohol, not the amendments. For the okay. Yeah, you, you would be voting after, after the public hearing. Okay. Okay. All right, is there any um, public comment? Public comment or, Typically, there would just be a, a notation of I'm opening the public hearing, then asking for public comment, then there being none. So, just to make note of it on the record. Okay, so we are voting on this right now. Correct? Just the alcohol beverage um, issuance. Okay. But we will not be voting this evening on the public hearings regarding the budgets. Okay, got it. But on agenda item 20 252, we're going to vote on that right now. Okay. If we get a motion. All right, is there a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item 20 252. Second. Second. Oh, Ken, are you good with that? I am, Mr. Mayor. Pro okay. All right, I have a motion from Council Member Bentley and a second from Council Member Cookerly to approve agenda item 20 252. Uh, any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. My apologies for that. That was a mistake in our agenda preparation. All good. That wasn't yours. All right. Will the city clerk please sound the next public hearing item? Consideration of an ordinance of the mayor and council of the city of Milton, Georgia, to adopt amendments to the fiscal year 2020 budget for each fund of the city of Milton, Georgia, amending the amount shown in each budget as expenditures, amending the several items of revenue anticipations, prohibiting expenditures to exceed actual funding available, and discussion regarding additional occupational tax revenue received. 
Agenda item number 2248, Ms. Bernadette Harville. Good evening again. Tonight we will be discussing the requests included in the fiscal year 2020 amendment number two packet. As you will recall, we went over a brief highlight of these amendments at the August 10th work session. And tonight I'll go into a little more detail on the amendments that are before you this evening. You can see in the summary shown that the revenue anticipations are increasing by $1.9 million. This is an overall increase of $545,857 from the original adopted budget. We will go over the key drivers of this increase in just a moment. Moving down to the expenditures, you'll see a decrease of $132,739 outlined in amendment number two's column in the gray. This is an overall decrease of $640,003 from the original adopted budget when you take transfers out to capital into consideration. The main drivers of this decrease from the original adopted budget include salary and benefit savings as a result of position vacancies, cost savings on purchases, as well as project deferrals. At the end of the year, there is a projected fund balance of $10,064,525, which is in line with our required reserve policy and takes into consideration the use of surplus fund balance in FY 2021, which we'll discuss in the public hearing regarding the proposed FY 2021 budget in a moment. Milton has been fortunate that although revenues have been impacted, the impact has not been as severe as originally anticipated as a result of COVID-19 and some of the um, closure system businesses we have seen. I would like to highlight a couple of the revenue line items that have been impacted and are requested for changes in this amendment. First, title ad valorem tax. House Bill 779 effectively increased the portion of TAVT revenues that will be allocated to all cities across Georgia. This went into effect in July, and we are anticipating an increase of $103,785 to this line item. Intangible tax has been coming in higher than anticipated as a result of the increase of real estate loans being issued. You will see a request to increase this line item by $222,099. Local option sales tax has been impacted, but again, not as severely as we originally anticipated. The increase here of $545,270 will yield an overall anticipated collection of $8.6 million for FY 2020, which is approximately 9% less than we originally anticipated um, with the $9.4 million that was originally projected. The final request I would like to highlight with the revenues is the $520,868 transfer in from the revenue bond fund. This is to cover bond eligible expenses made on the construction of the public safety complex before the bonds were issued in October. This is a one-time revenue that will not recur next year, and we'll be talking about this again later this evening. Before we move on to the expenditure amendments, I would like to take a minute to discuss occupational tax revenue. State law requires that a public hearing must be held whenever revenues exceed those collections in a previous fiscal year. Even with the impacts of COVID-19, Milton's occupational tax revenues are expected to exceed those of the collections from FY 2019. As in years past, any collections beyond our budgeted anticipations that have already been allocated will go to, into surplus fund balance to be used on non-recurring projects in future years. So it's just a requirement that we discuss that option and have a public hearing regarding it. Moving on to the expenditures. Over the departments, there is a $213,482 decrease related to salary and benefit savings related to those vacancies we discussed. So I won't take you line by line through them. They are all in the packet, but that is the total. There are two items I would like to point out related to staffing included in this request. First are the summer intern program. Um, it has been a success. The positions were originally requested in the city manager department. But upon implementation of the program, it was deemed a more appropriate fit for the positions to report to community outreach and engagement and the manager in that department. A request to move these two budgeted positions will carry over into the FY 2021 budget as community outreach and engagement seasonal employees should you approve this amendment this evening. 
And the deputy clerk position has been vacant, and there's a request to reclassify the position to that of a records clerk. Again, the reclassification savings will carry over into FY 2021 as well. Other requests of the expenditure lines include a reduction to professional fees in the city manager department in the amount of $70,000. COVID-19 caused a delay to the process, so these funds will be reallocated in FY 2021. You will see a similar request in the Public Works Department related to the citywide traffic count and speed study. This project is underway, but it will carry over into FY 2021. So a reduction in 20 moving into a request in 21. Information Services has identified that the city can delay the transition to the voice over internet protocol technology, which comes with a savings of $53,000 as well as the delay in the purchase of scanner equipment in the amount of $14,000. You'll see an increase to the medical supplies line item, which will be offset by anticipated revenues related to the CARES Act funds, and that will be in the fire department here shortly. There we go at the very bottom there, $26,250. And um, unfortunately, Camp Joyful Souls had to be canceled this year, and you will see in the Parks and Recreation Active Department um, corresponding decreases to the lines, line items related to the program. And finally, regarding the highlights for the expenditures, you'll see a um, release of the FY 2020 contingency funds to the balance um, some of the requests that we've just gone over, as well as a transfer out to the Capital Projects Fund to fund improvements to the passive acres of the former Milton Country Club to fund the difference related to the bid for the city's comprehensive plan, as well as the creation of a new account in the Passive Parks Department that will set aside money to address improvements needed at passive sites that do not currently have a master plan. Um, an example of this might be the dam repairs on Lackey Road. So anything that might come up so you guys can address those items, we will allocate those funds as you approve those projects. So that covers all of the requests in the general fund for amendment number two. There are memory requests of two of the special event funds, and you'll see them right here. First, we have um, the special revenue fund for special events. As you're aware, the pandemic has had a great impact on our ability to host some of Milton's beloved annual events. Community <coughs> Outreach and Engagement Manager Courtney Spriggs and I went through the line items to release funds related to cancellations, as well as some of the cost savings she had from some of the events held earlier this year. These funds will go towards funding events in FY 2021. Um, as you know, we are having an impact to our one local hotel, so these funds will be able to help fund those um, events without having to get a transfer in from the general fund. Event by event details are available in the presentation included in tonight's packet, but I won't go over them right now in any kind of detail unless someone has any questions. Um, the Confiscated Assets Fund has had a request to recognize revenues received in the amount of $25,732 as well as those identified as eligible for purchase um, related to confiscated assets in the amount of $21,433. So as police identify projects that are eligible, we allocate the funding towards those. Here we'll move on to the Capital Projects Fund. The main driver of revenue increase to the Capital Projects Fund is that transfer in from the general fund we talked about in the amount of $393,336. Staff has identified areas of cost savings that we'll see on the next slide related to software purchases within finance and information services in the amount of $202,824. Those monies have been released towards other project requests. We also have the savings from the construction of City Hall in the amount of $46,266, which will go towards funding the request of $92,000 to purchase a portable generator for City Hall, as well as the necessary electrical work um, related to using the generator. We have here on the next page that account we just talked about, the site improvements for passive parks. The total, including that transfer in, is 215000 set aside to be able to be utilized for some of the passive sites, as well as $250,000 specific to the passive acres at former Milton Country Club to continue the progress on the phased master plan objectives, and $45,000 to assess and address repairs needed to the dam on Lackey Road property. Moving on to the Green Space Bond Fund, there's a request related to property tax collections as well as interest revenue anticipations and a related true up to recognize funding related to debt service due. 
In the TSPLOS fund, you will see a revenue amendment related to investment income. As you know, um, interest rates are down, and we are seeing lower than anticipated collections across all the funds in investment income. You'll also see the allocation of $2 million from the fund balance. 100% of all collections in this fund must be spent on projects approved through the referendum or any authorized changes made to the project plan. Um, the recommendation for the Birmingham Middle Bridge has been completed and a replacement, um, they have, sorry, they have recommended a complete replacement of the bridge. So funding is being allocated to this project in anticipation of increased costs from the original project plan. In the capital grant fund, you will see revenues related to a grant awarded to the fire department for the exhaust extractor systems at station 41 and 43. Additionally, GDOT has closed the books on the intersection improvements at Birmingham and Providence. Construction expenses were lower than originally anticipated, and the city has received a reimbursement of $85,523, which will be transferred back to the general fund as operating funds were originally used to fund this portion of the project. And last but not least, we have the revenue bond fund. They have also experienced a decrease in, in anticipated investment income. There is a reduction of $920,868 to the public safety complex project, of which $528,68 is going to go back to refunding the general fund for expenses made before the bonds were issued, as we discussed earlier. And $400,000 will go towards the fire station alerting system, which was approved in the bond issuance. I just had to create a new project line item for that. And that is the end of the amendments for FY 2020. And should nothing else change, it should be the final amendment for FY 2020. All right, thank you. So I'm now going to open the uh, public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak in favor or in opposition? Okay. So I will close the public hearing. And that's it. If we will go on to the next agenda item. The third item is consideration of an ordinance of the mayor and council of the city of Milton, Georgia, to adopt the fiscal 2021 budget for each fund of the city of Milton, Georgia, appropriating the several items of revenue appropriations for prohibiting expenditures to exceed appropriations and prohibiting expenditures to exceed actual funding available. Agenda item number 2249. Ms. Bernadette Harville. <laughs> okay, now we'll move on to the FY 2021 proposed budget. The detailed draft can be found on the city website. Um, the communications director, the graphic designer, and I are working on some final um, enhancements to the bells and whistles of the book, but um, all the substantial numbers should not change from here on out. And as a matter of fact, um, nothing has really changed since the last discussion we had, so I will continue to do an abbreviated presentation this evening. I just wanted to show the calendar once again so everyone knows um, the steps we went through. Staff started back in May discussing long-range planning and interim goal setting as we're working towards our new strategic plan. Um, many of the requests are based on interim goals that stand alone regardless of the larger strategic plan so we can get the city continuing to move towards some of the goals we've talked about. We've had um, requests for m and and operating capital items come in from all the departments. Um, we've discussed them at length with each department head. And then our city manager, assistant city manager, and myself got together and looked over the priorities according to all of our city planning documents and made some decisions. And final um, decisions were made by the city manager in this proposed document this evening. We went over in great detail all of the requests back on August 10th. And here we are on the 9th for the first public hearing. And according to the state law, we'll have a second public hearing on the 21st. And um, should you approve it, a vote that evening. So here I just have our consolidated fund summaries. This kind of shows all of the requests across all of the budgeted funds for this year. And you can see that our city has a citywide um, budget of $41.9 million when you exclude any of the transfers out, because any transfers out and in will zero each other and balance um, across the citywide consolidated budget. Of course, the main driver of our budget is our general fund at um, that $31 million number. Now we'll move on into our general fund, which is the main driver of the city's budget. Is that too, too big? Sorry. All right, much better. So again, there have been no material changes made since the conversation back on the 10th. We did remove the transfer in from the capital projects fund. So overall anticipated revenues are now $29,511,367 for fiscal year 2021. 
The overall decrease to revenues stands at 3.3%, with the largest impact coming from one-time interfund transfers in from the revenue bond fund that we just went over that will not recur in FY 2021. There have been no changes to the operating expenditures from our conversation back on the 10th. And there's a slight decrease of $43,146 to the operating transfer out category. This yields an overall request of $31,140,044 in operating expenditures, or a 6% variance year over year. I would like to momentarily return to the discussion we just had surrounding FY2020's adopted budget. The original budget for FY2020 was $31,603,756. Of this, $26,709,238 went toward operating expenses, excluding the transfers out. The FY 2021 proposed operating budget, excluding transfers, represents an 8% decrease from that original adopted budget in 2020, or a budgeted savings of $2 million. The requests seen here include a budgeted use of surplus fund balance, and please note that those surplus funds can only be used for one-time expenses and will go towards funding the transfers to the capital projects fund that you can see right here at $6.6 .6 million. Additionally, in this request is an adjustment to salaries of 3%, which will total $250,626, a transfer out of $1.7 million to the revenue bond fund for debt service due on bond series 2019, which will be funded through general operating funds. And now I'm going to skip through the department by department variances. I have all the documents here if we need to discuss them, but I'm going to skip down to the MNO operating initiatives, sorry, maintenance and operating initiatives. Included in this operating request that we just discussed is um, all of these initiatives at $422,606, 200,000 of which will be set aside to address year one initiatives that come out of the strategic planning process that our citizens, our staff, our council, and all of our stakeholders will be a part of. There is a request to staff station 44 at the end of the fiscal year. Public Works has requested funding for a pilot street sweeping program for areas in the city with curb and gutter. They're also looking to obtain a backhoe and dump truck. Um, here we have the related maintenance and insurance costs that these pro uh, purchases will save the city some money versus continued rentals of the equipment with a break even in year seven and four respectively. Community development has also identified some savings by bringing the soil and erosion control manager in-house and is looking to reclassify the planning technician to planner one, enabling staff to handle more projects in-house and further reducing expenses related to consultants. Since we've discussed the special revenue funds and the capital projects ongoing in great detail, I'm gonna now skip down to the capital initiatives. Here again, we have the cost to purchase the backhoe and dump truck at 238,000 total and the truck for the soil and erosion control manager at 35485 And again, we have the actual cost to purchase the public works equipment, so this would be um, a overall savings after year four and seven. So those are all the requests related to the FY 2021 proposed budget. I'll be happy to go over any of the details, um, should you like to. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm now gonna <clears throat> open for the public hearing. If anyone's here to speak in approval or opposition, do we have any? All right, I will close the public hearing and we'll move on to the next item. Our fourth item is consideration of a resolution transmitting a draft capital improvements element known as the CIE 2020 annual update relating to the city's impact fee program to the Atlanta Regional Commission for Regional and State Review. Agenda item number 253, Mr. Parag Agarwal. We all knew that was going to happen. Just trying to be safe. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council members, today we are here in front of you to initiate a public hearing to transmit the capital improvement element annual update for 2022 to the Atlanta Regional Commission for the regional review and to the state for the state review. Uh, it's as, as per the state law, every community that has the impact-free program in place, they have to update their uh, uh, capital improvement element every year. And basically what this annual update does, it basically updates the list of capital projects which are funded through the impact-free program. Today we also have Bill Ross here with us from Ross & Associates. Bill is basically the founding father 
of the impact fee program for city of Milton, and he will tell us a bit more about the changes that have been made in this annual update. One second, I have to do this. Uh, I'm Bill Ross with Ross Associates. He just said everything I was going to say. <laughs> Annual report, you'll see them every year, has to go to the state. Uh, public hearings required to send it on in for, uh, for review for your constant annual recertification. If there are any questions at all, or if anything comes up in the public hearing, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. I know we're going to vote on it later uh, tonight. So I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there anybody here to speak in favor or in opposition? All right. I will close the public hearing. All right. We'll moving on to our zoning agenda. Will the city clerk please read the zoning rules and sound the zoning items? When the mayor and city council consider a zoning agenda, the following rules apply. Those zoning agenda items include rezoning petitions, modifications of zoning, use permits, and associated concurrent variances, in addition to ordinances, resolutions, and text amendments. I would like to acquaint you with some of the rules and procedures for this meeting. The applicant and all those speaking in support of an application will be allowed a total of 10 minutes to present the petition. The opposition will also be allowed a total of 10 minutes to present its position. If time remains, the opposition will be allowed to rebute. Our first zoning item is consideration of RZ20-10 to amend section 64-1, definitions as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2229. Next is the consideration of RZ20-11 to amend section 64-775, use regulations, C1 community businesses as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2230. The third item is consideration of the RZ 20 12 to create 64 1608.1 temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities administrative use permit. Agenda item number 2231. The fourth item is the consideration of RZ20-13 to amend Article 19, Crab Apple Form Based Code Definitions, Article 6.1, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2232. Our fifth zoning item is consideration of RZ20-14 to amend Article 19, Crab Apple Form Base Code, Article 5, Table 9, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2233. Our sixth item is the consideration of an RZ20-15 to amend Article 20, Deerfield Form Base Code, Definitions Article 6.1, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2234. Our seventh and final zoning item is the consideration of an RZ20-16 to amend Article 20, Deerfield Form Base Code Article 5, Table 10, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2235. Mr. Parag Agarwal and Ms. Robin McDonald. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Thank you for giving this opportunity for the Community Development Department to uh, present um, this uh, series of text amendments. Um, I hope it didn't scare you with all the items. I. Uh, hopefully can explain it all and make sense and not have to deal with it for too long. So the primary purpose of these text amendments is to create a separate administrative permit solely for temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Um, the Planning Commission at its June 22nd meeting unanimously approved the text amendments after a lengthy deliberation. Uh, the city attorney 
um, and the fire marshal worked closely with us, with staff, for the creation of these text amendments, and they were also present at the planning commission to be able to answer uh, any of their questions and give input as needed. In addition, um, we're asking you um, uh, to consider a cleanup of the administrative permit uh, of seasonal business use to include limited form-based code transect zones. The following slides are a short description of each text amendment and how they contribute to the overall goal described above. So I like to uh, compare it to uh, the ingredients of baking a cake. So um, we have several different ingredients that in the end is creating um, what we need to enforce this new administrative permit. Under RZ 2010, um, it is to amend the definitions of the zoning ordinance. And we're proposing a couple of new definitions, and the first one would be temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facility. So it defines it as is used primarily for the retail display and sale of consumer fireworks to the public. Excluded from this definition is any non-structural consumer fireworks retail sales facility. Another new definition is non-structural consumer fireworks retail sales facility as created to be an excluded use in all zoning districts. So basically this is a description or a definition of a trailer towed by a motor vehicle or a tent canopy or membrane in a thin, flexible, or foldable layer of material used to block sun, wind, or water structure in which consumer fireworks are offered for sale to the public. So. This is what we do not want at all within the city. It's somebody threw up a tent or, you know, brought in their back of their truck and started selling fireworks that is not permitted at all within the city. Um, a text amendment, well, let me um, preface that. Um, we have the definition um, once we were working on uh, what needed to be done. Um, we need to bring forward a section of the zoning ordinance, use is prohibited in all zoning districts, and that's what that definition or that term will be put into that um, section in the upcoming zoning cycle. So in a couple months, you'll just see one independent um, uh, text amendment that's uh, left over of these fireworks uh, uh, set of uh, amendments. And then within the definition of roadside vending, it excludes temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facility. Uh, going on to RZ 2011, this is to amend uh, the C1 zoning district basically excludes temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facility from that zoning district. Also, staff notes that there are only a handful of locations zone C1 within the city, primarily the Birmingham Crossroads, which has C1 within all four corners. So that would be excluded or not allowed to have sales of uh, temporary fireworks facilities at that in C1. Going on um, under RZ 2012 um, to amend section 64-1609. This is the section that's um, cleaning up the seasonal business use. Uh, when we did all the additions of the form based code, uh, we uh, did not uh, include the crab apple form based code T5 and Deerfield form based code T5 and T6. So examples of that would be the Christmas tree stands at um, Home Depot or pumpkin sales. Um, I think they did that at the corner by the CVS at Bethany Bend and Nine. So that's a different um, administrative permit. I, we're just cleaning it up. Okay, um, to the guts of it, to the flower of the cake, shall I say. Um, RZ 2012, creating 64-1609.1, temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. And so, um, just want to talk about primarily where we will, where we're proposing to allow it to happen is um, in, within Crabapple form area is the T5. And as you can see, um, 
The very dark purple is T5 right here at the intersection on the east side of Birmingham Road, down to the west on the north. And there's a little piece um, to the south, I believe, where um, the pizza shop is and a few offices. And then if you want to go further west, uh, the linear area along Arnold Mill. Well, I would uh, like to say most of that linear area, um, except below Green Road, has been developed with residential, um, as well as much of the T6 has already been uh, developed uh, with, res with mixed use. So. And on to the Deerfield form-based code, uh, we're proposing allowing uh, this new administrative permit uh, for the temporary sales facility uh, to be in T5 and T6. So let's um, look at the Deerfield area down by Windward. Um, so in a Highway 9, T5 is the lighter of the purple here along, um, it's a linear area along Highway 9, um, up to Bethany Bend to where the CVS is, and then uh, T6, which is all of Windward, I mean uh, Deerfield, Office Park, Verizon, that area. And then let's uh, look to the south. Sometimes we forget about North Main Street, but we do have a section of that area that is T5. Um, and there is a brand new uh, self-storage here in the front on the north side of Highway 9, as well as there's a mixed-use um, shopping center to the south. And there's a tiny little undeveloped piece over here um, a little bit to the east. So these are the areas that we're proposing to allow this um, fire, uh, temporary fireworks facility. Along with looking at um, where it can be located, we're creating development regulations that include design standards um, dealing with color. We're requiring it either to be white or off-white. The size of the structure shall be no larger than 800 square feet and 15 feet in height. I believe the 800 square feet is driven by the fire code, the state fire code. So um, the signage, um, maximum 24 square foot banner, and there is some uh, signage that's required by the state uh, fire law that needs to be on the facility as well. Um, and then uh, further required distance from other temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Typically, we've only had one in the past few years at 4th of July. Um, agricultural related uses such as farms, equestrian and veterinary facilities, and healthcare facilities. So I forgot to write down there that it's within 300 feet. Okay, so those are the development standards uh, or requirements for this admin administrative permit. So um, in regards to RZ 2013 and 2015, Crabapple and Deerfield Form Based Code definitions, we have separate definitions within those sections of the code. But after further considerations, these were no longer needed, and we're asking council to uh, recommend withdrawal of RZ 20-13 and RZ 20-15 at the time that you uh, make your votes. So we'll go back to RZ 2014 um, to amend Crabapple Form Based Code Table 9. So I don't know if you've ever seen or looked at it, but we have a big grid with all the different um, uses that are permitted in the different transect zones. And instead of let, you know going through the whole um, table and including every kind of administrative permit and use permit, we um, just put a, a statement at the top of that table stating that um, go to the administrative and use permits to see what is permitted in the transect zone, in the form-based codes, okay? So uh, within our ordinance, in whether it's use permits or administrative permits, there's a section that talks about what is permitted by zoning district. So therefore, um, that's just a short line that goes on each, the Crab Apple form-based code, as well as the Deerfield form base code. Same issue with RZ 2016. So with that, um, I will be open to any questions you may have or comments or suggestions. Questions for staff? Rick? Just a question in the Deerfield area. 
I, I think that's one of the areas that we've seen these facilities go up every year, right on the corner of CVS. Does this preclude this, or does this now allow them to still do the same thing, but it has to be a white building within the standards? Correct, the later that you said. Okay, yes. so all these different areas they could that are the dark purple, they could in fact put up stands. Right, correct. Okay. Um, okay, so for example, um, Thompson and Hopewell, where mm -hmm. the, that's still, is that zone historic? Correct. Where the, the Hardeman store, okay, so, so we don't need to um, prohibit temporary stands there, or do, or do we? So we kind of have used our belt and suspenders and all those C1 that we excluded it. But if you um, look at the actual verbiage of RZ 2012, it states um, at the top of the uh, administrative permit, it said required districts, crab apple at this point, I mean, this is up to y'all. Crab apple form based code T5 transect zone, Deerfield form based code T5 and T6 transect zones not allowable elsewhere. So stating within this um, administrative permit, it's only allowed in um, the form-based code areas. What you just listed. Y yes. What you just said. Correct. Okay. So it's not in T4, it's not in T4 open? Correct. Okay. Well, it's correct. It's and in T5 for crab apple, which is the highest. Um, yep. Transect zone. It's in T5 and T6 in Deerfield, which is the top mm -hmm. two highest categories. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That mm -hmm. so we're covered by specifying that. All right. Um, one thing that I observed on the use that's currently um, taking place is um, camping, uh, overnight stays. Um, camping, you said. Mm-hmm. So can we add something? Um, that no overnight camping y or overnight yes. stays? Sure. Yeah. We can. Um, What's in regards to retail? So the stand that was located at the CVS, so one year they, they stayed overnight. Oh, OK. The fireworks. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. I mean, I was, OK. So, so if we could include. Possibly, but do you want to include some hours of operations? or? Something like this. Well, uh, there are hours of operation already exist, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So that would be covered by. Well, but I think what's saying, what she's saying is people, well, they do it a lot of times with trees, Christmas trees as well. They'll stay overnight. Um, so we could just say no overnight stay permitted. But can you, if it's on the prop, if it's on that prop, does the property owner? Is that not allowed for so? Doesn't I mean, I guess it could be part of their lease or their rental agreement, but we can't really control. That's what, what I was wondering if that can even be controlled. They might worry about theft. Yeah, it's an open thing. Members of the council, let me let me offer up that we might want to take a look at this to see if other Milton regulations already prohibit that conduct, as opposed to possibly making it part of this ordinance. Um, I suspect there are. I mean, that just seems on its face to possibly offend. I know there's a no camping section. We have an Excuse urban me. camping section. No, or, so I haven't really looked at it, so I don't know. I don't it. know it off the top of my head. But right, right. But rather than making new code up on the fly, it might be best that if, if this is an issue, we can certainly address it. But I think it may already be addressed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So, uh, yeah, sure. So, Robin, let's say we pass all these things. You compared this to being all the ingredients that you needed to make a cake. Um, what is the what is the ultimate benefit for the city? We've got more control over exactly what's going on. Correct. Okay. So, let's pretend for a second that the control we really wanted to exert is to not allow these types of operations either permanent or temporary it does it give us the power to do that yeah. we can we no, cannot we exclude it i don't think Council yes, Longoria, and we looked at that quite a bit um there there was really no way to to do that effectively 
without putting within the same confines a lot of activity that is generally perceived as acceptable in Milton. Um, so we did the best we could, and this was based upon my guidance. Okay. I don't want to be argumentative, Kent. Be did we pass ordinances that essentially uh, prohibited the sale of vaping products in the city of Milton and prohibited having vape shops in the city of Milton? I believe so. So, so selling fireworks is different in what way from that type of retail operation? I think that the problem is, is that the ability to have a roadside sales environment is something that is, um, in a lot of ways, fits into sort of the bucolic character of Milton. You know, the roadside vegetable sand, the roadside, listen. No, no, I, I agree with you. The, the challenge that we have, and one of the things that is um, causing me difficulty, is that we routinely talk about the fact that Milton is an equestrian city as well as a you know rurally themed city. We could go down the list of those things, but but the fact is we do have a lot of horses in Milton, okay, and we've got a lot of property that's devoted to horses, and fireworks and horses just don't mix. We spend time communicating before the Fourth of July, before Labor, I mean before Memorial Day. Before all these different dates, please don't fire fireworks between these times or in these areas and those kinds of things. And so I find it interesting that we're not taking more proactive steps to restrict that even further. Well, okay, and you're, you're right, you're now delving into use. And the General Assembly no, has... No, no, I, no, I, I get it. it will, using the fireworks, it doesn't matter where they bought them, okay? And we can't control that because that's a state-controlled thing. But promote, I mean, it's like, again, get back to my vaping example. People can still go buy vaping products in Alpharetta or in Roswell and use them here in Milton. We didn't outlaw the use, but we stood up for what we believe is correct and we prohibited the sale within the city limits. Right, but neither of those products, I mean, you know, the General Assembly has been fairly clear. Uh, they have not completely dominated the field with respect to firework regulation, but they have certainly shown an interest um, in it, as opposed to, say, vaping, which they have shown very little interest in. So I do think there are okay. differences with respect to the two sorts of products. I think Milton, Milton has done a very good job of attempting to really address in almost an ironclad way all of the negative attributes, the garishness, all of the things that a lot of folks find distasteful about those facilities. Um, so then is it fair to say, Ken, that these changes get us in a, a position of as much cr control as is possible? and gives us the flexibility to um, deal with this to the extent that we can. I agree with that, because okay. that was the charge that I was given by your staff. <laughs> All right. Um, and that's what I've attempted to do and guide your staff on. So yes, council member, I agree with you. Hey, Rick. Yeah, and I guess to say it a different way, what you're telling us is there's no way, I know we can't prohibit retail sales with like in Walmart and different existing shops. But as far as a temporary stand, we can't just totally say no fireworks, temporary fireworks stands. I could not get comfortable with that conclusion, correct? Okay. Uh, but the only thing which I would want to add is even if we are allowing temporary stands on some locations, we do have design standards in place. So that A, we are, we are limiting the locations where they can go. And second, we are trying to put some design standards in place. Even if they go, they will have to look the best possible stance possible. Right? So it's a dual approach. And, and to go on your point, and I totally agree with both of you, but if we put all these design standards on these firework stands, they're they going, might go out they're of going business. Yeah. Right, right. right. Yeah, but, so I think more difficult to participate. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. Especially if they can't yeah. sleep there. I'm sorry? Especially if they can't spend the night there and right. watch their, their oh. inventory. I mean, that's why they're staying there. So, but, I, you know, I appreciate, you know, just um, reiterating, you know, I got a lot of comments, you know, why wouldn't you just ban this, right. you know, altogether? And I know it's frustrating, especially for the equestrians in the community, to be able to to have these stands, but if this is the closest we can get to making it, um, you know, something that's not an easy thing to come here and do, I think this this is an improvement. Um, Tammy, is there any public comment on any of these agenda items? No. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question, Mayor Pro Tem, and this is something where I do need to jump in. So, what? Ms. McDonald did and made good sense was to give you a omnibus presentation oh, under one know. agenda item. <laughs> All right, so that's great, but not so fast. <laughs> so um, I do think what needs to happen, Mayor Pro Tem, is you need to, just as you did, ask for the public hearing with respect to uh, agenda item 2229, close it because the clerk needs to make a, a, a note that every one we had an open and closing to the public hearing. I think this will be fast and I forgive, I forgive me for having to go through it that way, but I think she needs to sound the item, uh, ask for the public comment. Uh, Ms. McDonald's presentation will be the same for each one. Let, let the record reflect. So pretty much just read my script the way it says. Oh, is that what it says? Well, I mean, just I through each those. One. Okay. Three items. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Do you want me to reread the item? Sorry. I'm do you sorry. need the item reread? The first agenda item? No, I don't need the first agenda item, but I do need two, three, four, five, the rest of them read. So okay, right so now, all we need to do is, is a, a, you know, ask close for the, any public comment, see if there's any. If not, shut it down. Read the next item. Same thing. Watch. But we'll vote report. on each. We'll vote on each one. Correct. At the, okay. Got right. it. Okay. So we're on agenda item number two two nine. Um, since there's no public comment, we will close the public hearing, and I'll open it up for a motion. Mayor, I move that we approve agenda item number 20-229. Second. All right, any discussion on the motion? All in favor of approving, oh, I gotta read this right. I don't wanna mess it up, can get me in trouble. All right, we have a motion to approve RZ20-10 to amend section 64-1 definitions as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks and retail sales facilities. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The city clerk will sound the next item. The second item is consideration of RZ 2011 to amend section 64, 775, use regulations, C1, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2230. All right, uh, is there any public comment on this? There's not, Mayor. Pro okay, so I will close the public hearing and open it up for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to approve Agenda item number 20-230. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Bentley, a second from Councilmember Cookerly to approve RZ20-11 to amend section 64-775 use regulation C1 community business as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. If the third item is consideration of RZ 2012 to create 64-1608.1 temporary consumer firework retail sales facilities administrative use permit. Agenda item number 2231. All right. Is there any public comment? There are none. All right. So I will close the public hearing and open up for a motion. Mr. Go ahead. <laughs> You're quicker than I okay. was. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I make a motion that we approve agenda item number 20-231. All right, I have a motion. Oh, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Morg, a second from Councilmember Longoria uh, to approve RZ20-12 to, to create 64-1608.1 temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities administrative use permit. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The fourth item is consideration of RZ 2013 to amend Article 19, Crab Apple Form Based Code, Definitions Article 6.1, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2232. 
All right. Any public Mayor, comment? There are none. All right. I'll close the public hearing. I'll open it for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to withdraw agenda item number 20 232. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. All right. Uh, second? Is there a second? Second. Okay. You good with that? Well, okay. Yes. Discussion? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, so 13 what? and staff's recommending 13 and 15. Right. Okay. Yeah, when I said that earlier that we wanted to approve them all, I would cut myself confused. Okay. I stand by my second. So that's withdrawal. Okay. So I have a... Motion from Councilmember Bentley, a second from Councilmember Longoria to withdraw RZ20-13 to amend Article 19, Crab Apple Form Based Code, definitions Article 6.1 as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks and retail sales facilities. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, next one. Our fifth item is consideration of RZ2014 to amend Article 19. Crabapple Forum Based Code, Article 5, Table 9, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2233. All right, any public comment? There are none. All right, I'll close the public hearing and open for a motion. M Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item number 20 233. Second. Okay, I have a motion from Council Member. Bentley and a second from Council Member Cookerly to approve RZ dash or RZ two zero dash one four to amend Article nineteen Crab Apple Form Based Code Article five Table nine as relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks and retail sales facilities. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Next this next item is consideration of RZ 2015 to amend Article 20, Deerfield Form Based Code, definitions Article 6.1 as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer firework retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2234. Okay, any public comment? There are none. All right, I'll close the public hearing and open for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to withdraw agenda item number 20 234. Okay. Thank you. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Bentley, a second from Councilmember Longoria to withdraw RZ20-15 to amend Article 20 Deerfield Form Based Code definitions Article 6.1 as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks and retail sales facilities. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the next one. Our seventh and the final zoning item is consideration of RZ 2016 to amend Article 20, Deerfield Form Base Code, Article 5, Table 10, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. Agenda item number 2235. Any public comment? There are none. All right, I'll close the public hearing and open for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item number 20 235. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Bentley, a second from Councilmember Morg to approve RZ20-16 to amend Article 20, Deerfield Form Based Code, Article 5, Table 10, as it relates to the creation of temporary consumer fireworks retail sales facilities. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And since there are no items under unfinished business, we will move on to our new business items. Will the city clerk please sound the first item? Consideration of a resolution transmitting a draft capital improvements element 2020 annual update relating to the city's impact fee program to the Atlanta Regional Commission for Regional and State Review. Agenda item number 2253, Mr. Parag Agrawal. Uh, Mayor and the City Council members, today we have a resolution in front of you to transmit the annual update of the capital improvement element to the Atlanta Regional Commission for the Regional Review and to the Department of Community Affairs for the State Review. As I mentioned, it is the state law that every community that has an impact fee program in place, they have to update the they have to update the capital improvement element on an annual basis. Uh, apart from this. Our department is uh, launching a new project that will basically update our impact free ordinance next year next year so again that will basically look at the new new capital projects that 
could be funded through the impact fee programs and how can we incorporate more flexibility into the city's program. But the, but the resolution that's in front of you is basically uh, annual update, CIE update that should be transmitted to the ARC and to the DCA. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Farad? All right, is there any public comment? There are none. Okay, I'll close the public hearing on that. Public hearing on that. Um, I'll open up for a motion. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I make a motion that we approve agenda item number 20-253. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Morg and a second from Councilmember Bentley to approve a resolution transmitting a draft capital improvement element 2020 annual update relating to the city's impact fee program to the Atlanta Regional Commission for Regional and State Review. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. If, uh, will the city clerk please see on the next item? Consideration of an amended emergency ordinance of the Mayor and Council of the City of Milton, Georgia, under Section 3.1 of the Charter of the City of Milton, Georgia, to provide the operation of the City of Milton, Georgia during the public emergency known as the novel coronavirus disease 2019 global pandemic to become effective upon adoption by the council to supersede the existing emergency ordinance and for other purposes. Agenda item number 2254, Mr. Ken Gerard. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, thank you very much. You have quite a bit of experience with respect to this particular ordinance. Uh, at this point, uh, you may recall that the city council originally adopted an emergency ordinance in March uh, of this year, March 16th to be specific. Uh, I don't know what number uh, of this version that we are on, but it's been quite a few. Uh, all as the city charter requires, we adopt these in 30-day increments, which is appropriate. We have to continually reassess. Uh, and what we have sort of contended ourselves as doing, and many governments, local governments, have done the same, is to run our state of a locally declared emergency coterminous with the governor's uh, statewide declaration of emergency, which, which was in fact continued and will run from September 10th until October 10th of 2020. And so it is my recommendation uh, just to uh, have sort of a belt and suspenders approach to how Milton operates that we do the same. I will tell you, members of the council, that as this ordinance was originally conceived, it was quite robust. Uh, Milton has taken a very pro-business uh, sort of outlook with respect to use of our emergency powers to address businesses that have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. And while we had a lot of different sorts of relief measures in some of the earlier iterations of the ordinance, we're now down to basically just two, which is the continued allowance of to-go malt, beverage, and wine sales from restaurants with consumption on-premise licensure, as well as certain additional signage opportunities for retail businesses. That's really all we're doing. We obviously have put in place our reopening plan for some months now. It is my recommendation, however, that we continue to run coterminous with the statewide emergency. I feel like there is little downside and could be some, or little, up, uh, little upside, a lot of upside, little downside to continuing to do that. So that is my recommendation, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. All right. Any questions? All right. Any public comment on this, Tammy? There are none. All right. Close the public hearing open for a motion. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I move that we approve agenda item number 20-254. Second. All right, I have a motion from Council Member Kirkerly, a second from Council Member Moore to approve an amended emergency ordinance of the, of the Mayor Pro Tem and Council of the City of Milton, Georgia, under Section 3.18 of the Charter of the City of Milton, Georgia, to provide the operation of the City of Milton, Georgia, during the public emergency known as the novel coronavirus disease 2019 global pandemic to become effective upon adoption of the council by the council to supersede the existing emergency ordinance and for other purposes. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. If uh, moving on to our final new business item, will the city clerk please sound the item? It's the approval of a subdivision plat and revision. The name of the development is 15060 Freemanville Road, land lot number 554 and 555. It's a final plat with eight lot subdivision with gated private street. The total acres is 2.58, and it's a 0 0.325 density lot per acre. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, and City Council members, before we make a presentation on this final plat, I would like to introduce you to the newest member of the department. 
uh, Tracy Wiles. She is the land development manager in our department in place of Melissa, who left us a few months back. Uh, Tracy is a landscape architect. She has more than uh, 10 years of experience, experience working in the private sector. Uh, she has a strong focus on customer service. Everyone in the city of Milton already loves her. And she is basically responsible for uh, issuing the land development permits and uh, reviewing and issuing all the plats. On a side note, she's also the twin sister of Tr Tammy. <laughs> and basically, they were, uh, they were uh, discussing today that how can uh, Tracy take over Tammy and how can Tammy take over Tracy's position. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so she, she, uh, it's her first presentation to the city council. So we have a, a small presentation to discuss the plat and how it meets all the city code requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Parag. Um, I'm happy to be here tonight. The entire staff has been very welcoming since I've gotten here. There's a lot of exciting things happening in, in the city of Milton, and so I'm happy and proud and thrilled to be a part of the team. Um, tonight, we're going to present to you uh, a final plat. Um, it's been a while, I understand, since we've presented a final plat to the city council, I think due to COVID and, and those types of things. And as a reminder, um, if a plat contains more than four lots, then it's considered a final plat and uh, is presented to the City Council for approval. So this is Deer Haven Preserve. Um, it is a final plat. We could do the next slide. Oh, I got it. Okay, excellent. Uh, it is a final plat with uh, an eight lot subdivision with gated private street on 24.58 acres with a total density of 0.325 lots per acre. It is located off of Freemanville Road, highlighted here, just south of White Columns Drive. The plat itself is eight estate lots that range in size from two acres to 4.66 acres. Uh, to take a closer look, um, this is a gated subdivision. Deer Haven Lane is a single private road that has a 50-foot access utility easement with 24-foot wide pavement and rollback curbing. Uh, the plat does meet site distance requirements, and there are local and state buffers on the property, but the plan does meet all of our codes. This, again, is just the summary of the site info. The zoning is AG1. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. All right, any questions before public comment? Good, Laura. I just want to make a comment, especially um, I would love if the property owners that own this, this was part of a farm, and they, they sold this off. And um, so very happy to see three three acre um, subdivision uh, large lots, lies. which is phenomenal in the market that we're experiencing now in Milton. What, what they for went to have a large lot subdivision. So... Maybe we can have a special day for people that do stuff like this, but it's wonderful and it's what Milton's all about. So, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, any public comment? There are Good. None. All right, I will close the public hearing and open it for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item number 20-255. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Bentley, a second from Councilmember Morg to approve agenda item number 20-255. Two five five. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll move it on to council reports. There is one item that we need to uh, that would like to talk about and tell the citizens. Um, as many of you know, the Georgia Department of Transportation is considering building a four-leg mini roundabout in Birmingham Crossroads, specifically where Birmingham Highway intersects with Hickory Flat and Birmingham Roads. This is a GDOT project, so it is not funded or controlled by the city. Still, we do want our residents to have the opportunity to voice their opinions. They can do so by going to our City of Milton website at the home page, scroll to the bottom, click on the word news, and there you can review the GDOT information. 
and have access to the GDOT web link for you to submit your comments, questions, or concerns. It's important that there is a very limited time for people to leave a comment. In fact, Friday is the last day. So you, if you have an opinion, please go onto the GDOT website very soon. I know that's an important uh, project we have going on, and I'm glad we're trying to get as much information out there to the citizens. Um, any other council reports? All right. We will move on to staff reports. Public Works. Good evening again, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, because that was one of the items that I wanted to, to bring up to you as the uh, closing period for the comments. So thank you for doing that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have bids. We've opened bids for the construction of the roundabouts at Thompson and the roundabout at uh, Hamby, and hope to be presenting that to you at the next council meeting for an award. And we also opened bids up for the Public Works Maintenance and Operations contract, and that should be presented to you as well at the next uh, city council meeting. Road resurfacing and road con reconstruction is finally going to be underway fairly soon. Uh, we're expecting them to begin probably within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will uh, post on social media any traveling impacts that will be out there. And there will be some, particularly when they're working on Hopewell and, and Providence. Uh, you did mention the, the comment period. Thank you. Uh, the bid for the uh, repair of Saddle Springs box culvert is now out on the streets. So we'll be presenting that to you in uh, four, five, six weeks, something to that extent. So that's, that's a pretty big project as well. Right-of-way permits, we issued 40, 14 right-of-way permits for the month of August, and two of those were driveways, residential driveways, and 12 of those were uh, right-of-way permits uh, for work within the right-of-way. And maintenance, we only had 84 work orders. I say only because that's actually kind of low for what we're used to getting. We usually average about 100, 115. Uh, most of those were potholes and sign issues. Uh, we did have some debris and trash removal scattered throughout uh, Milton, and we did have eight eight dead animals. I know you all like hearing that. So that, that concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to help you answer them. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Chief. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Council. Um, just a few items. The Fire Administration has moved into the new public safety complex on the admin side. Um, we're getting settled in there. The, um, the station is not ready to move into yet. Um, we're still waiting for the uh, station alerting system to be finalized, that project, so we can alert the firefighters of a call. So once that occurs, Engine 42 will move to Station 44, and we'll leave the rescue at Station 42 until we decommission that station. This way all our facilities have a unit in there and firefighters available for response. Um, once that unit, uh, the station's decommissioned, Rescue 42 will then move to Station 44, and we'll realign our zones through dispatch for the quickest unit response to make sure we have proper coverage. Um, with that, we've started our um, design on Station 42 with Croft and Associates. Um, we've already had about four meetings. We have another one on Monday. So we're ex excited about that project moving along as quickly as it is. And the Georgia Firefighters Standards and Training has done their annual review of our department. They look at the fire department, the station, the apparatus, as well as all our training records. And once again, we got a perfect score, so we're pretty proud of that. And we completed our ISO review last month, and we expect to have our new rating within six to eight months. They're a little bit behind. Everything's virtual, so it takes a little bit longer for them to go ahead and process that. But we're hoping that we, uh, we improve, maintain, or at least Im or improve our, our rating from a class two. So, And on Friday, September 11th, since the COVID and there's no real um, ceremonies for 9-11, um, we are going to do each fire station. The firefighter is going to raise the American flag to half staff at 846 in the morning. We'll get pictures of that, and we'll be doing that at Station 44 as well, along with the um, police department. And that's all I have for tonight. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Rick? Just one quick question. Is the, we've been kind of sharing, I guess, with Alpharetta, the ladder, ladder truck is housed at their station. Is that moving over to 44 also? Not until next year. 
Um, okay. We had an agreement with them, and we've talked to them. It, it started three years ago when we started the bill, the project, and when we were designing it and all of that. That they asked that we give them time to fill that void that will be created by that ladder truck. So they asked if we could keep that there until July of 21. Okay. Um, they've already um, started the design and of their new ladder truck. They're going to be putting a new truck in there because of the Avalon area. They need to keep a, a ladder or an aerial apparatus there. So they're doing that. And they have to hire additional personnel as well. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and when is the move in? When will that equipment be ready for move in? As soon as that station alerting system is completed, um, I'm hoping in the next two weeks. They started testing this morning. Um, they did run into a couple of problems, but I'm, I'm hoping in the next two weeks. Yeah, it was supposed to be um, last Friday, but we ran into a couple of glitches, and um, so we're working through that. But that—that's the most important piece: is that we have the alerting so we can alert our firefighters. So, okay. thanks. Thank Congratulations on your perfect score. Thank you. No, well it's 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 not me. It's it's I know. it's the crew. Yeah. Well, it is but, you, but it's but, the whole group. Yeah. Congratulations. No, they, they do they do great work and maintain yeah. great records, and, and we're really proud of that. So we've had a perfect score, um, for as far as I can remember. I know. So. Very good. Great. So. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sir. Good evening, Mayor, Pro Tem, and Council. I have just a few things to tell you about that we've been up to. We've actually been able to host two outdoor events at Broadwell Pavilion uh, while maintaining the appropriate CDC recommendations. We had um, the Chambers Chairman Circle After Hours event, and then also the Mil Milton Business Council had their first After Hours event um, last week. And tomorrow, weather permitting, we're going to do it on the plaza outside, but we're going to have our launch, which is the biannual event where we invite our businesses that are two years old or less to come to City Hall and meet city staff and the Milton Business Council and the North Fulton Chamber. Um, so that's tomorrow. We are also planning on having our Meet Me in Milton on October 17th out on the green. We're going to do a movie. So again, to attempt to keep people away from each other. And then very exciting, um, we got final confirmation at the end of August that Phillips Healthcare, they had an expansion of 88 new jobs with with an average of a hundred thousand dollar salary um, over in the Deerfield area. Cool. Any questions for Sarah? Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. All right. Um, I need a motion to adjourn into executive session to, to discuss land acquisition, personnel, and potential litigation. So moved. All right. Um, have a motion, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> Good question. Yeah, we'll go back to the end. Yeah? Okay.
All right, Madam. a motion from Councilmember Moore, second from Councilmember Bentley. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, got a motion from Councilmember Moore, second from Cookerly. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you later. See you next time. Two of those things were one thing and a third thing was a mistake. Sorry that was discussed in executive Thank session. Thank you. Hey, thank you. <laughs>